Get rich or die trying. I'm on my 50. Collecting rent checks. First to the 15. Life and star life. My lucky stars are So Amanda reached out to me on Instagram, and it was cool because her and her husband have actually written a course about mobile home park investing. So I thought, what better way to put the information out there than to have her on here and just kind of interview and talk about everything. So I want to go over a little background about Amanda. Um, she spent years climbing the ladder at a large credit card company. So like a lot of us, she worked in corporate America, myself included. Um, after starting a family, she was pulled to pursue her own business to be more in control of her life. Guys, that sounds really familiar. Like she parallels my life. Um, she started investing in real estate in 2018. So not that long ago. So what's really cool is I love collapsing the time frame, And this is a pure example of how you can grow your business quickly. Um, we shared a little bit before this about how she started with single family homes and rehabbing. And that just really wasn't that great to her. And we'll talk about that. Um, so she really got into mobile homes after that. And today, Amanda and her husband purchase and add value to mobile home parks. They currently own three parks with 80 lots. One mobile home park increased their net worth by over 400,000 in just 18 months, guys. So I know a lot of you have small goals. Some of you have big goals. And it's like, how can we accomplish this faster? So she's going to talk about that. And she now loves working with other investors teaching others how to get into mobile home park investing, and most importantly, like ourselves, spending more time enjoying life with her family. So I want to welcome Amanda Cruz here today. How's it going, Amanda? Hey, Christy. Thank you. It's great. Thank you for having me. Well, what I love about your last name too, another parallel law of attraction, my oldest son's name is Cruz, spelled C-R-E-E. Oh, wow. So I thought it was really cool when I was like, okay, there's something to this. So. Yeah. <laughs> So tell me a little bit um, about how you stumbled upon mobile home parks. And more importantly, before that, what got you into single family homes? Yeah, so I, we, I wanted something different. I wanted to be in control of my future and work really hard for myself and for what we could build for our family. And so got into real estate and, you know, just bought a duplex and then we did a burr. And that was fine, but we kind of sucked at it. Like we, I wasn't good at estimating rehab costs. I didn't do it long enough to get good at it. Um, and we knew we wanted to go quicker. We started doing individual mobile homes, something called a Lonnie deal, where we'd buy a home and then turn around and sell it and do seller financing. And that was awesome. We loved that approach. We did that a few times and just flipped a couple. And then we knew we wanted to go even bigger there. We loved being in affordable housing. We loved getting people into houses they otherwise could not have been approved for. It's hard to get financing sometimes on a pre-owned mobile home. So when we stepped into that space and provided that financing, then, you know, we have somebody who's paying off their first note this summer, and then they're going to be getting a house, you know, and, and only paying lot rent from then on out and saving themselves hundreds of dollars a month over rent. That's just a great scenario. And we wanted to do more of that. And um, so we went into parks and, and sort of haven't looked back from there. Which I love because we talked about this. There's a lot of people that teach different things in the real estate realm. And you, like I, share a very common interest of helping people, being humble, and really caring about people. So I feel like the same reason I love mobile homes is they're affordable. You know, it could be a single parent. It could be someone elderly. They can affordably get into something. They're not, listen, I love my renters, right? Like that's great. It makes us money. But ultimately end goal, I would love for everybody to have home ownership. It's the truth. So, so yeah. now you and your husband do this business together. What is that like? Cause my husband and myself do this business together. Are you guys very similar, different? Oh, we're so different. Like I always you know, would joke, like if we were in a corporate world, there's no way I would want to work with my husband. And in, in fact, in a lot of ways, like we try to not work together directly and, and it's taken us a few years to kind of separate out what we do. So he's the boots on the ground, right? He's doing the due diligence. He's working with our managers in the parks. I'm doing the underwriting. I'm sort of talking to other investors, getting the landscape, getting deal flow and doing the underwriting side. And then kind of once we decide to pursue something, 
it's all, it's all him. And he kind of is hands-on from there. And then I just kind of check in so every I now love and then. That. That's my relationship. It makes me laugh because you're my husband. You're like the numbers, the statistics, and your husband's yeah. probably like the dreamer, the big picture. We can do this, the cheerleader, right? And you're like the reality check. <laughs> yes <laughs> or no. So you talk a lot about numbers. So I know a little bit about your previous uh, career history. What did you do prior to this? Yeah. So I got a degree in chemistry, um, which I did nothing with ever. And then I went to work as a war gaming analyst for the Navy for a few years up outside of DC. And then through that, I got a master's of applied statistics, also did nothing with that. Um, I went on, which I thought I was going to use when I went to work at a large credit card company. And I worked there for, gosh, seven, eight years managing a team of analysts. Um, and I really did love it. Like I, I would have recommended that to anybody who wanted a W-2 job. That just wasn't my passion, what I wanted. So because of our investing, I was able to leave that in early 2022. That's awesome. I love that story. So do you have to be a math wizard to be able to analyze mobile home parks or deals? So I truthfully like don't ever use my degree in statistics. I, I probably couldn't really tell you much about actual <laughs> statistics. Um, you, you do need to understand revenue and you need to understand expenses. Those are important pieces in how commercial assets are valued, right? It is a commercial asset. It's valued based on and then that operating income it brings in. So you do have to understand your different pieces of income and your different pieces of expenses and be able to do, to understand what your payments are going to be depending on the price you pay. But otherwise it's, it's no more complicated than a single family house or an individual mobile home. It's just addition and, and subtraction really. So I love that. And guys, don't freak out because you're like, I'm not that great in math. Um, Amanda has actually put something fabulous together that we're going to talk about at the end of this to really help you if you're brand new, if you're experienced, because I get questions all the time about buying mobile home parks. And my first common is, listen, you know, buy a mobile home, at least go walk one and know what you're doing before you buy an entire park. But if you're at that point where you want to buy a park, you need to know what the heck you're doing because you can make a lot of mistakes. And I've owned parks, you know, that could be with buying homes that need a lot of work that you didn't account for the right repairs. That could be county regulations and rules, all of that good stuff. I mean, there's a lot of important stuff with due diligence. Um, so when you look at parks and buying, are you financing them on the back end through small banks? Are you owner financing them? What does that look like on the ones that you've purchased? Yeah. So we've done financing through small banks um, for the most part, and it's it's not very difficult to get financing on a mobile home park as long as it's big enough. Um, because it is a commercial loan. So depending on the bank, they're not gonna be very interested in a $200,000 loan on their books. And so going for a park that's around probably 500,000 or bigger, a small local bank is gonna be a really good bet. You definitely wanna make sure whoever you go with as a lender already has at least one mobile home park on their books. Otherwise you could be wasting your time and they could pull that, that funding at the last minute before closing. And then if it's a smaller park, that's a really good scenario to, to get seller financing because it is going to be more difficult to find a commercial lender who's excited about a $200,000 loan. And you and everybody else trying to buy that park is going to be in the same boat. So if the person own, who owns it wants to sell it, they need to work with you. And so that's a really good scenario for working out terms. And that's great because a lot of questions I get are how the heck do I get this financed and who do I go to? What market are you located in and where are your parks located at currently? Our parks are in North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. Which is and so, and we look around that area. Like we're currently scouting in North Carolina, South Carolina, a little bit of Georgia, which I think are some of the best, you know, opportunity because there are so many, I think, per capita. I, South Carolina, I don't know if they still are, per capita had the most mobile homes, period. Oh, wow. And I would closely bet that the other two states do as well. So mm -hmm. um, how did you market to find these parks? Where did you go? Where did you find them? Or where are you looking now currently? So we try to do everything off market, right? We're, we're getting 
the parks. We have, we're literally looking on Google Maps to see what could be a park. We, when we first started, we would drive around and we, my husband cataloged all the parks around us because there isn't one big list of all the mobile home parks. So we would literally spend time like driving around and finding them and getting the phone number and calling and asking, hey, who owns this place? Who, how do I get a hold of the person who owns this? And so we would spend a lot of time doing that. And now we have other people, um, you know, who scout for us, but that's, we always try to go direct to seller. And you can, there are brokers who specialize just in mobile home parks. And I keep track of what they're doing. I think it's really good just to sort of keep a pulse on the market, but I haven't yet found anything from them that I'm willing to buy. Um, so everything we've bought is off market. And, you know, interestingly enough with that, though, I think there's going to be a little bit of a turn here, especially with interest rates rising. I always have all the broker listings come out, right? I'm on all of their um, mails. And in the past month, I've seen so many coming out that say all serious offers considered and price reduced, which we had not been seeing in years. Um, so that's definitely good news with interest rates rising that, that maybe um, the prices are starting to come down a bit. That's interesting. Yeah, because a lot of people, and I've noticed this too in our market with the brokers, um, they're not necessarily mobile home park experts. Maybe they list a lot of apartment buildings and different things and the different criteria for that with the mobile home parks is different with the homes, you know, uh, individual homes versus park owned. So I feel like a lot of times, a lot of listings in our market are, hey, I had a family member or a friend who passed away and I just got this listing. I know nothing about it. And it's very overpriced because they look at it based upon the land value, which isn't <laughs> always... You know, it's like, we're not going to recreate 500 more spaces here, guys. Like <laughs> we need to see it's performing. So I've noticed that as well um, within that. Yeah. And sometimes you can find a good deal like that, even on the MLS where normally single family homes are, because like you said, a lot of times the realtors who are list those, they are not mobile home park experts. They did it as a favor to a friend. And so they have no idea how to price mobile home parks. And I guarantee they're not getting many offers because people don't look for mobile home parks on the MLS. So if it is listed there, you can probably go in and talk the right language and say, look, here's how this should be priced. Here's what I can offer you. And here's why. And, and maybe you can make a deal that way. That's cool because I've noticed things mislisted on the MLS too, exactly like you're saying. So it might be listed as a single family home, but it was actually, a, and these are for the smaller parks. It was a smaller right. park because somebody did live in the house. And then you start digging and you're like, okay, that's interesting. They have 10 mobile home parks on here or, you know, mobile homes. How did that happen? So I, that's great advice when looking for those. Um, when you go into a park are you know, I know you said you like to put a little sweat equity in, obviously you're looking for something that you can improve. So what does that mean to you? So like, I, I know we've talked about this and for those of you that know a little bit about mobile home parks and don't there's park owned homes where the park actually owns those homes and can rent them out or seller finance them back. And then there's pads. So just the spaces in the park where individuals actually own their own homes. So what are you typically looking for when you're analyzing a park? So we, I prefer tenant owned homes. Now, some parks just happen to have a lot of park owned homes and that's fine. I always underwrite as if we're going to turn those into tenant owned homes. Um, but that doesn't make a huge difference in the price I can pay except for Basically, you're calculating the net operating income based on it being lot rent only, as if all the tenants own their own homes. And then what you would do if there were park-owned homes is you would basically add back a price for each home once you calculate the net operating income for the tenant-owned home uh, portion. Um, but what we're really looking for is opportunity to go in and increase the value of the park. So are the rents under market? Can I improve? Can I increase those lot rents? Are there utilities that the residents are not paying themselves? A lot of times the parks will just absorb the costs of the water. Well, guess what? If I have free water, I'm running a car wash out of my house, right? 100%. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're using all the water if you're not paying for it. And so having the residents pay for their own water, getting sub meters in place or um, 
or in some cases, utilizing submeters that are already there that just hadn't been used before, um, that all those things can really increase your net operating income and then directly increase the value of the park as well. Perfect. I love that. I, I'm laughing because we live in a community where the water is included in our HOA. And I'm like, that is the worst idea ever. Number one, the leaky toilets, whatever. Right. But my five-year-old who's autistic loves baths and swimming. I'm like, we might be responsible for this entire bill. <laughs> I hope they never change that. If they do, we're selling immediately. Right. <laughs> Um, when you look at a park and you go into it, let's just say there's 50 spaces and you go in and you see that there's, you know, income coming in from pads, there's income coming in from park owned homes, but there's like 15 free spaces. Nobody's on them. Would that be a park you'd stay away from? I mean, even if you could probably, it all comes down to negotiating, I know, but let's say you got it at the right price. Would you want a park that's completely filled versus one that there's room to fill spaces? What are your thoughts on that? I don't have a huge preference. What matters to me is I need to make sure that I can at least break even when I close. Okay. And if that means that, you know, then I go in and increase the rent and then I go in and build back water and, you know, it takes a few months before I'm actually making cash flow, that's totally fine with me. Um, and so the same case would be if there are vacant lots and there are some people who will go into a mostly vacant park and just love to do the infill and that can work for people as well. Um, but there are a few challenges. Like I would not recommend that on a first park doing a heavy infill, unless you have experience with mobile homes and moving them because it's a whole piece. Like you want to make sure you understand the cost because it's not cheap to move a mobile home. You have to get it from one location to another. You have to get the skirting back on, put the decks back on. And, and depending on the location, like the city, city of Hickory in North Carolina was so tough on us. We had to rebuild decks and like make them bigger on these mobile homes because they didn't pass the code in the city. So there are a lot of pieces that can really add up if you're planning on going in and infilling 20 lots out of 30 it can be a little bit more challenging. Um, so I would definitely recommend only planning on a big infill if you've done mobile homes before and you know how to move them. Um, but otherwise, bringing in one or two homes can be a great way to just add value as long as without that, you're still comfortable with the park and the numbers. Absolutely. I would agree 100%. Um, that brings me to another question. When you're buying this park and you get your financing, obviously you have a number in mind of how much repairs you're going to have to put back in the park. So, so some of that obviously is, hey, we can immediately make, you know, 1500 extra just by raising the lot rents. Right. But we might lose some tenants, right? We know we prepare for that knowing those things could happen too. Maybe they don't want to pay. Maybe they do. Maybe that's a great thing. They move out because you don't want those people. Um, anyway, honestly, that's even rare. Because if tenants own their own homes, they don't move them out of the park because it's too expensive. They just sell their home to somebody else who keeps paying the lot rent. So we have yet to actually lose a home. That's great. Out of any park. Good. So myth debunked. I love that. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> rare. Sometimes you have these thoughts. Now, when you come back in and put improvements into the park, what are you doing for the money on that side? Are you using some of the money that you're making monthly? Do you have like a nest ed? Do you have private money or? You can do any of those things. Um, now what we do is set aside that money to begin with. We know that going in that we're going to need the down payment plus the turnaround costs and obviously plus the legal costs. Um, also due diligence, do not underestimate the amount of money it costs to do due diligence on a mobile home park. It is way more than you would think. Honestly, that is one of the big reasons we created our course is we were just so unprepared when we did our first um, due diligence at the cost of everything and exactly how to do it and all of that. So don't underestimate that either. Um, but we take that all of those buckets and that's the money that we set aside and we either, you know, might, we might partner with somebody or we haven't needed to raise money yet. We have people who, you know, we can, who want to partner, um, but we haven't done that yet, but we would, if we, if we needed to, and it just, know that you need that bucket of money to start with. And could you go in and do these repairs slowly, but surely you can, it's just going to take that much longer until you can pull money out of the park. And, you know, is your partner or your spouse going to be like, 
hey, like we bought this park a year ago. We're still not making any money from it. Maybe now it's time um, to go so. back to work. You got to get another job, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. that's right. <laughs> okay. Um, when you talked about due diligence, just give me, I, I know not exact numbers, but you are a numbers person. So what would you say you typically put into the due diligence? Due diligence can, can run from like 15 to 25, $30,000, right? Because you have legal fees with, you know, you have lawyers, so you're going to have those legal fees. If you have septic tanks, especially that's a a whole piece. You want to pump those tanks. You need to be having somebody look inside of them and they can't tell if the tank is cracked unless it's pumped so that you have to pump every single tank, or at least we pump at least half of them. So we have a really good understanding of the infrastructure. You want to test all of the utility lines, right? The water lines, the sewer lines, you want to make sure that you understand what the material is. And you also need to do an environmental study. So if Let's say back decades ago, there was some sort of plant or something on that land. If you don't do an environmental study, it's called a phase one. If you don't do that, and then it comes up later that the water was contaminated and people were getting sick, you can be held liable simply by doing the study and having an engineer say, yep, you're good. Um, all of a sudden you legally aren't going to be held liable for that, but that costs money surveys. If you're going through a bank, you'll have to get a survey. So these things are way more expensive um, than you might think going in. You might even have to get an appraisal, um, especially if the people you're buying from, a lot of these sellers are mom and pop sellers. They've commingled their personal finances with the park forever. There's no such thing as the business finances. And let me tell you what, they're not going to give you that information sometimes. Um, and so the bank is going to need to have an appraisal done for the value of the park then because they don't have those financials. Now, if you do seller financing, then you can choose to not do a survey if you want. You don't have to do the appraisal. So there are lower expenses you can do on that side. Um, but you need to have the money aside aside for all these different buckets. That's really important. And that can go back to negotiating too, because you do have to put all that in. I laugh because usually when you're going to a mobile home park, it's like, where's your, where's your PLs? They're like, here's my notebook and my pen. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like you literally write it down. Yeah. But it's all, I mean, it's all written down and documented right. for 30 years because typically what I'm finding is the wife ran the books, the husband did yep. the maintenance. Yeah. So there's something to that, that I love. Cause I'm like a husband wife business, but I'm like, okay, we got to get this online. Like <laughs> this is not going to fly, but which is yeah. another reason why they have trouble selling them because people are like, this doesn't make sense. What do I do? Where do I go from here? That, thank you for bringing it up. That's such a good point. So don't be too scared of that. Um, don't be too scared of that because if you think you're going to go get these books, like an apartment complex is going to have, or you would buy from another investor, you're not going to get that. Um, you're going to get handwritten stuff. You can ask for bank statements to prove that they are getting their deposits, but you're not going to have your, your QuickBooks download. You're not going to have any software they've been using. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm encountering the same thing on the single family home uh, portfolios that a lot of um, I'll say baby boomers are liquidating. It's the same thing. And it's so yeah. funny. And listen, they made money. They're not in right. it because they didn't. Their system is just a little bit different. They're very and much well, more involved. Yeah. And they didn't need a new system. They you know that's what the millennials came in and did, right? Like they're not going to pay for a system. system. Yeah. That's extra <laughs> money. I'm not doing that. I'll that's just write right. this notebook, which, you know, there's something to that as well. Yeah. <laughs> but this is good too, because on the back end, if one day you and your husband, and I tell people this with our short-term rentals, with everything, what if something happens and you want to sell and you go to sell to someone else, you have to make sure your books are good. You have to make sure everything's in order when you buy, oh, yeah. because it makes it so much easier on the back end to actually sell a successful house, mobile home park, mobile home, whatever it is, which is really for important. sure. For sure. And one thing that I like to do too is because it is all valued based on the net operating income. And so if you're doing something like improving septic systems or paving the roads, that is operating expense, right? That is a one-time cost and that can actually be removed. That can, um, you don't have to take that as an expense. And, and so making sure that you're highlighting those one-time big expenses um, that aren't ongoing costs, make sure you, you have those set aside because when you then go to sell one day, um, you can reduce that from your expenses. 
So this is what's cool about your course. And I'll go into that in just a little bit, but I saw you have accounting like in the course and different tools, which I don't notice. in a lot of systems people are teaching, it's just like, here's how to wholesale a deal. Here's how to buy a house. Good luck. Go with it. But you actually have a section um, talking about accounting, which I thought was brilliant because it's easy to make the money. It's hard to track the money. It's even harder to track the expenses and go through everything. You don't, if you don't have an accounting degree, I feel like that's where a lot of people get into big trouble. Yeah, we do talk about the line items that you should expect to see. And those are the ones that you would put in. Um, and then we do talk about the softwares that you use on an ongoing basis to collect rent and stuff like that. Um, which makes it a lot easier because there are a couple of different options that you can use. So we try to go into that as well. Okay. Awesome. So I, I want to know what are your top three pros um, of owning a park? And I don't ever want to say cons because cons makes everything sound negative, but like, what are your top three pros and your top three? Here's the real truth type thing. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay. So it, it's affordable housing. That is that is top, right? Um, I'm very aware of just the market cycles. And right now being recession resistant is so important to me. And mobile home parks are recession resistant. Um, you also have a lot of sellers who built the parks themselves. Okay. That is not the case with apartments. You are buying from an investor when you buy for an apartment and they want the most money possible. And that is all they care about. When you buy from the mom and pop sellers who created the parks, they care about the tenants. They want to know that you're going to take care of them, that you're going to keep the park up, right? Um, so they, they care more about a holistic picture of you and your background. And also, um, and that way you can sort of get a better deal in some ways, but also just it's more relationship based than just transactional. So, you know, I like that. And there are also, they're decreasing in number. Um, we got some homes from a park in North Carolina that was being flattened to build something higher use, right? A apartments or townhouses or something. And so the number of mobile home parks is actually diminishing every year. And there are a couple being built, but nowhere near the number that are being taken offline. And, and, the asset class is getting more and more popular over time. And so when you have that diminishing population of them, um, then that's going to make their value increase over time. Um, you can I also get a better that. deal, I guess, as a fourth thing, kind of, you can yeah, get a better no, deal on them those are super than like apartment complexes. Yeah. I love that. You're totally right. And I think a lot of older people were willing to put the time into build and do. And I, and I hate to say this in, in a good and bad way. I feel like when you're a little bit younger and I'm one of those because I grew up in a very hard work family, I grew up on a farm and you're taught to work, 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 work. Now this generation is a little different. I want to work smarter. I want to spend more time with my family. I still want to make money. I'm not right. saying that, but I'm allocating differently. So I think a lot of younger investors come in and they say, I don't want to do the work. I'd rather just buy this, right? That's true. It's so, so true. Um, yeah. Uh, so on the con on the cons, because like, yeah, well, it is not rainbows and butterflies in mobile home parks. Space. And neither are single family homes, right? We right? talked Nothing about that. Is. Yeah, me with everything. So I think it is it is hard work. You have to learn. I think that is that is a big thing. You have to learn mobile home park specific stuff. It is different than single family houses. So you have to be willing to get into that niche. Um, private infrastructure, septic systems, wells. These things are not like nice. They're, they're not great. Like we actually bought a, a park and the person who had it before us, he ran it into the ground and there was one septic system that stopped working years ago. And instead of replacing it, he didn't do anything. So the residents had no choice really, but just they had a pipe going out to, you know, 50 feet behind their house. And that's where all the sewage is. Um, so it's, it's not glorious and any means. So you have to be willing to, you know, kind of apartment investing or short-term rentals and Airbnbs. Those things are sexy. They're exciting. You want to take people by and show them your assets. You, you know, I had somebody ask, Hey, can I park my camper at your park? And I was like, I mean, yeah, sure you can, but I don't think you want to, it's not an entertainment. <laughs> it's not like a vacation destination. Right. Um, and so you kind of have to take that ego cut a little bit. It's not this like fancy, fancy thing. Um, 
And then I think the third thing is, is knowing your risks like with the infrastructure. Um, it can be a big deal if it fails. So you have to spend the time to understand what you're buying uh, because it can cost a lot of money to replace private infrastructure um, or replace even water lines and sewer lines. As soon as you're talking a park and not an individual home, prices go up, costs go up. Um, and so you have to really understand more because the cost of the mistake is bigger. Uh, yeah, I love that. That's that's really good advice because I think people see, oh, it's performing. It's making this much money. I'm just going to jump in and do nothing. And of course we have you know, a less expensive market. Maybe it's up more so now, but we have a lot of big buyers coming. And I know you see this from different areas, dumping money in. And if you don't have a good management system, if you don't have a good system and you don't know what you're doing, you can lose a lot of money. And then they become that bad park owner because now they're motivated to sell. They bought it thinking it would be great. Yeah. So, well, what I want to do right now, I'm actually going to share my screen so we can go a little more into this. So guys, what's really cool is I talked about, and you know, like for those of you that have checked me out on YouTube or just gone to my website, I have a course on individual home investing. So it literally walks you through the day and day out of buying a home, wholesaling a home, rehabbing. And what Amanda has done is well beyond that, because this is just buying an entire park but it goes through specific. So I'm actually going to click on here, Amanda, and go through. And you guys, you can go to christyduckett.com and this will lead you to Amanda um, in her course. I just put it easy since I had her on here. I have a link on here. Um, But it goes through the all-inclusive guide to your first or next mobile home park. So again, this could be for somebody newbie. This could be for someone super experienced. It doesn't matter because I promise that if you bought something, you probably didn't know all of this that she's talking about today. So tell me a little bit about the takeaways, what you think are some of the most important, which we see right here of why your course, you know, is really important. Yeah. So it goes from no experience at all to completely knowing what to do with a park. So how to find parks, how to get your criteria, how to do due diligence. That's a very comprehensive component in there on exactly what to do with due diligence, um, how to get a park under contract. Let's say you close. What do you do on day one? How do you even let your residents know that you're the new owner? Um, So going through day one, and if you want a manager, how do you find a manager? And what should that manager do? And what systems should you have in place? And what softwares can you use? how to add value to the park and how to sell for the most money possible. So it sort of goes through um, the complete from beginning to end of owning a mobile home park. I love it. And she's broken it down just like I did in mine of modules with herself and her husband going through explaining everything from beginning to end, each step of how to do it. And what's great is she's broken it down into short modules. So it's not like you have to sit there and go, oh my gosh, I got to spend 12 hours right here in front of the computer. I hate those courses. That drives me insane. This is broken down. So you could watch a piece of it go, okay, that was a lot. Let me go apply some of this. Let me go back and kind of go, you know, from there. Now, what I thought was crazy, um, she's only charging 497 guys. That to me is like, why are you not buying this course? But after she told me how much due diligence costs, I was like, Amanda, you need to like charge quadruple this, right? (laughs) So it really is affordable. I mean, I think there's no reason that you shouldn't go here and buy this if you're going to buy a park. And the truth is, if you buy a park and you don't do this course, you're insane because you're going to lose money. So no, you can go here and link in. Now, I know the next question I'm going to get about you, Amanda, is do you and your husband do any type of coaching or anything like that at all? So what you can do when you buy the course, there's an add-on to do two 30-minute sessions. And I would recommend if you're going to do that to take the course first, and that way you're not paying for the coaching time just to get information that you're going to get in the course. Um, But you can add on to 30-minute coaching sessions as well. Okay. Awesome. So if you've got some burning questions after you go, make sure you go through the course first. Don't call them and you haven't done all the modules. That drives me insane. I haven't watched everything, but I need this quick answer. It's like, well, that answer is actually in the module. So watch that first. Know what your questions are and know that they haven't been answered and then kind of go from there. So again, you can go to christyduckett.com. I want to ask you, Amanda, what are your goals for 2022? Like edging off, I mean, we're already, you know, five 
I'll just say six months into the year, honestly, because we're halfway through May. Um, what are your goals for 2022? Yeah, we're looking to add about two parks this year. Okay. Would you be interested if somebody watching this has a park, maybe bringing it to you, a lead? Do you do like, uh, I won't call them referral fees, but wholesale fees if somebody were to bring you something and it worked out? Yeah, sure. I mean, to go into a new area, we need a pretty big park. Um, so I haven't had anybody yet like just happen upon like a 50 lot park that is just a really good deal because you have to really be searching um, for those. But certainly, um, you know, we could do that. We've, we've partnered with people as well on, on parks where, you know, they sort of do the day-to-day -day and then we'll be on the phone with them, like helping them go through stuff and providing that sort of guidance on how we would approach it. So we've done that as well. Okay. I love that. So guys, here's, here's a big no, no, don't. So I want to also, yes, follow her on social media. So what's the best way to, for them to find you on social media? Yeah. On Instagram, it's at investing with Amanda at investing with Amanda. And I'll have uh, Noah throw that up on the screen so people can see that. So don't inbox her with 5,000 questions. Don't monopolize her time for free. Nobody likes that, right? You don't either. <laughs> if you're a doctor, you don't like people asking you at the soccer game about your foot that hurts, right? Same situation. So if you really are truly wanting to invest in parks, please buy the course, number one, set up a call with her and her husband to go through that. And be serious. I mean, this is a business. This is a financial investment. And this truly can change your life. So yeah. I just want to weld for being here. It's been awesome, Amanda. Um, and good luck on your 2022 goals. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Have a great day.